Hey. Hello and welcome to Talk Heathen. I do not have access to the soundboard, so we are once again without audience cheering. Um, but I'm certainly happy to see you all today. I'm V La Bianca, and with me is Anthony Magnabosco. Hello, V. Hello, audience. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Hey, it's so good to have you on the show. I'm so excited yeah. we finally get to host something together. I know, I know. It's the first time we've hosted. This is so cool. Thank you for inviting me on. Of Seriously. course, of course. Uh, we've color coordinated, so we're both uh, very we somber and, and serious today. Um, we didn't get too our... crazy with it, though. I think I just said, you want to color coordinate it? You said, hell yeah. Hell and yeah. Uh, I wear I black get... all the time. <laughs> I could do black. So here we are. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, it's the 420 episode, so I hope that everybody is uh, making the most of that. Um, <laughs> we don't have too many announcements today, and before we get into calls, I do want to talk a little bit with you, Anthony, about what you do and kind of where people can find you, but let's get mm. some housekeeping out of the way first. As always, uh, this is a 501c3 nonprofit um, organization, uh, Atheist Community of Austin, um, and if you like what you see here, if you want to keep us going through this very strange time where we're all remoting in and doing this on a, I'm on a, uh, uh, ironing board right now, um, <laughs> then, uh, uh, consider donating, consider giving to our Patreon at patreon.com slash talk heathen to me, um, about two thirds of the way through the show. I will be reading our top five patrons. Uh, so definitely give us a like, uh, give us some. Uh, some attention there. If you can't donate, and that's totally fine. Everybody's kind of stressed right now with money. It's tight. Uh, so consider uh, liking, consider subscribing. We're trying to get to 100K uh, right now, and that's going to be exciting when we get there. We'll probably do something fun uh, once we cross that threshold. Um, and then our only other announcement today is that the uh, crew, the uh, cast of the nonprofits is going to be on Discord at three. Uh, so if you're interested in having a conversation with those guys, uh, go head over there. That's going to be awesome. Uh, but other than that, I think we're ready to go. Anthony, yeah. uh, so this is the first time that we've hosted together. Right. And I don't the the first time uh, we actually met at the American Atheist conference last mm -hmm. year in Cincinnati and I yeah. came over and I was super awkward because at that point I was just a fan and I walked over I was like can I buy a t-shirt so I bought, bought a t-shirt and then I made this really really awkward like baby eating joke because haha atheists and mm -hmm. you just didn't get it at all <laughs> which you oh. shouldn't have it was a terrible joke but I was just like oh I was mortified I walked away I was probably like, honestly I was I was probably <laughs> nervous just uh i don't know I, it's it, this might come across as strange but i do get a little nervous still meeting people especially at conferences and things like that and then when somebody comes up and they know my work but i'm not familiar with them it makes me mm. a little awkward so your joke was probably really good i just probably dropped you know i, I was probably just oh. too wrapped up in my own anxiety i get it <laughs> no worries it was it was pretty bad i'm i'm happy that it has lost to everyone except for me. It just mm. keeps me up at night thinking about it. Um, so tell people, <laughs> <laughs> tell people what you do. Uh, what what's your channel? Um, kind mm -hmm. of what's your your approach to this whole online atheist activist thing? Yeah, my approach, I suppose, is largely asking people questions and then giving them ample time to explain why they think that that's true and how they concluded that that's a good reason for thinking that it's true. It's called street epistemology. Hopefully people who are watching this broadcast are somewhat familiar with the approach. I would be surprised if you're not today because I'm noticing that people who are on Talk Heathen or the Atheist Experience or other shows that the ACA produces are using it. They're using more questions and they're giving people time to explore their the quality of their reasons so that's largely what i've been doing I, I i strapped on a gopro and started talking to people in the texas area largely to challenge their views but in a respectful way where i'm asking questions uh but pushing back and giving them something to think about and it's been catching on it, it's been growing and and i've been uploading I, th I was out with Jenna like a few months ago and we, did you watch that by a chance? I did. I yeah. saw that pop up the other day. Uh, I've mm -hmm. been, I've been keeping an eye out because she had told me when she was heading out that she was super excited. So uh, it was <laughs> it, good to finally actually, watch it. It turned out really well. And uh, we, we, uh, I think we'll even maybe show a clip uh, later on today uh, when we are on the atheist experience, but no, it's great to be here with you. And I, I love what the ACA is doing with their shows and the approaches that I'm, I'm seeing more and more. And uh, it's good. I, I think we're giving atheists a good name 
and and we're we're not letting theists walk all over us at the same time either. We can still push back with good questions. Right, right. There's that balance between you know being mm -hmm. being having the the courage of our convictions <laughs> while also not necessarily needing to have the last word or the snappy comeback or the you know yeah. just it, it is a conversation ultimately and i know that i benefited greatly from watching your videos back when i was still just starting to figure things out not only because you were asking questions cool. that i was trying to wrestle with at the time but also having to come out to my family and have those conversations was made a lot easier because i had that kind of uh, more, more gentle approach, uh, to mm. model it after. So I wasn't, I wasn't going and pretending I was Hitchens. That would have been bad. Mm. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Um, we have some calls on the line, which is exciting. So let's jump Excellent. to Nicholas. Um, Nicholas. Hi. Welcome. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, what can we do for you today? What's going on, Nick? Uh, uh, hey. Um, long time viewer, uh, first time caller, and uh, as um, my my wife died uh, Thursday, the seventh of uh, May. Oh my goodness! Um, I'm so sorry. And, sorry to hear that. And um, I'm the one. I'm the one who found her. And um, I realized when I saw her that she was just gone. So I've been an atheist since I was seven. Uh, that's like when I figured, you know, like I don't believe in any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, for the first three days of it, I had this sort of weird situation where I was trying to negotiate with her to come back, even though I don't believe in an afterlife. It was kind of weird. And uh, the way everybody keeps, because everybody else I know has some like range of re religiosity. So mm. they don't know how to deal with me mm. because they're do they're dealing with it in a completely different way. I, I don't, and uh, they're having, which I'm, I told them that they could have whatever ceremony they want to help them deal with this in any way they want, because we didn't care about ceremonies. We just didn't. So mm -hmm. our only idea was she was going to be cremated and I was going to get her ashes. And when, I go, I'm going to be cremated, and we're going to be together forever, mixed together, like that. That's the only kind of together forever we were thinking about. Yeah. But everybody else keeps telling me, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying, everybody else, keeps, everybody else just keeps telling me, like, ways to talk to our three-year-old daughter about where mom, mama's at, mm -hmm. and it, it I just, I just, I just try not to say anything. Like I just don't know what to say when they start talking in religious terms. Like telling her mama's in a better place, running with her brother in heaven. I'm like, I just go blank face because I don't want to start a argument over my wife yeah. because she was a very sweet woman, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings in this time. Would you rather that they don't, don't make any don't. suggestions whatsoever with regards to how? You how you should handle this situation? Would you rather they just stay out of it? Or are, is there any value whatsoever in what they're telling you, even though it may be not the advice that you're actually hoping to get? Well, I know they care about me and that sort of helps. I just, I just sort of lock up. Like, I don't know how to respond to it because I just see religion as insanity like a form of insanity that you're taught from a very young age, like to have. That's all I've ever saw religion as. I've been, like I said, I've been an atheist pretty much since I was seven. I've thought I've reject all forms of supernatural claims since I was a little kid. And uh, so I don't know how to respond. I don't want to, I don't want to say it was like, because I don't even know how to deal with this because right. I don't, I just want to be honest 
with my daughter, but she's three. Sure. Yeah. There's only so much she's going to be able to take in. And then on top of it, all the religious twists to the whole thing, I suppose would probably just even maybe it might make it easier for her, but it might make it more confusing. It's hard to say, but yeah. I mean, you, she's your daughter. You are responsible for her. And I, I would say that you probably have the priority in, in how you decide to explain to her what's happening. That, that would be my thought. I don't know, V, if you have any. Yeah, uh, I, I, I know that this is, I mean, this, there is no easy way to have these kinds of conversations or, or to, or to be in this space. It's a really, it's, I cannot imagine being in that space. It, it uh, and my heart goes out to you and your daughter and, and your whole family. Um, yeah. My thinking here is, I think you're right. I think you should be honest with your daughter. I think that the short term benefit of maybe having an easy pat answer, which isn't really going to make the pain of not seeing her mom go away. It's just an easier answer to give in the moment. Uh, I don't necessarily see that as the benefit of that outweighing the initial the, the confusion that that's going to create later on as she starts thinking about these things especially with you as her dad who is an atheist so my my thinking and this is not my uh advice i think this is um i believe i was talking with daryl ray about this um on another show the your your daughter is going to take her cues from you Right. She is going to decide how traumatizing and how horrible this is from you. And while she is, of course, going to have to with Hello? I was just saying that's why I tried. Like, she was at my sister's since the day that, uh, like, up until just this Friday, because I can only have her on weekends because I work so much. Uh, she stayed at my sister's when she came back, it just, I, I have to hold back like from crying cause I don't want to like her to like wonder why dad's crying. Right. So I just, uh, I try to keep from doing that around. I just, it just reminded me how different things are when she got back to the house because mm -hmm. of how her mom, her mom was disabled. So she was always in one place. She was always in pain, so she usually just sat, because we keep our bed downstairs because she couldn't make it upstairs. She was always here, mm. every day, for, for years, and then she's just gone. And I didn't know how to deal with it. I, was, I, I went through the bribing stage of grief, just trying to bribe her to come back, just crying for days. And I don't yeah. want to do that in front of my daughter because it freaked her out the day because mm. she was here. She was in her, she was downstairs in the crib and uh, I didn't let her see her mom or anything like that. I just, but as soon as they were carrying her away, I just broke down. And then she started crying. That's mm -hmm. when she started crying was when I just fell. I was already falling to pieces, but she thought I was playing. But I just completely was destroyed seeing my wife leave. And that's when she started crying. And I made a point to myself to not break down again in front of my daughter. And, like, she's laying next in bed with me right now. And I, I gave her her mommy's favorite blankie, and I kept one. And my wife's cremated with one because she had three blankies she slept with. I'm just trying to manage, and her family, like every, all the family, my mom keeps trying to tell me what I believe, like they think that I'm going to deal with it better if I deal with it from their frame of reference. <laughs> sure. That's what it feels like. Yeah, I, I have a couple thoughts on that, if, if you allow me to um, respond to that. Like, I, for my, I've got lots of thoughts going through my head. The first one is your daughter seems like she's very young. She's probably not going to remember too much of it, even even maybe coming across and noticing you crying or something. Um, but um, how you are responding, sp responding to it over the years, I think she will remember that. And she's going to probably be exposed to all different explanations of what happened to her mom. So... It might be a better yeah. use of your time to, it might be a better use of your time perhaps to 
prepare her for the type of responses that she may hear from family members about what happened. Hey, you know, when auntie comes over, she may mention that mommy's in heaven. And some people think that mommy's in heaven, but I actually don't think that that's the case. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you can prepare her for the possible yeah. stories that she may be hearing so that she won't be surprised when she hears it. And then maybe you can even encourage her to come and talk to you afterwards to say, yeah, auntie did come in and tell me that mommy's up in heaven, that type of thing. Um, try to you know, prepare her for the type of responses that she may start to hear so that you can have discussions about that and what she thinks is maybe the best way. To, she may say, you know what, I guess, daddy, I, I like the idea of being able to see mommy in heaven again. That might be something that you just want to let her sit with and not and not get in the way of because that's her preferred way of dealing with it. But there's nothing saying that you can't also share what you actually think happened. And right. I think that that's important. She's she's your rock. She, she you are you know you need to be there for her. I think you know that. Um, you have the dominant narrative. So I think at the end of the day, likely because you're spending more time with her, she'll probably be more inclined to think what you think. But prepare her for the alternatives. I think would be my advice for you. Yeah, but, uh, I was trying to keep my like questions like short and coded but it's crazy because there's so many things that i just don't know how to like 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 i said just like uh how they deal with it how they want me mm -hmm. to explain it to my daughter mm -hmm. how they want mm -hmm. me to deal with it how can i put all these different things into just one topic to bring on to the show and yeah, that, I was trying to. But it seems like it keeps going, and like it just branches out into more and more just scattered, like uh, things to talk. It's just my family, like they're nice. They seem to be like holding back, but when they first started talking to me, and so, and it keeps worming its way into the conversation, I'm like, this, I get the only thing I get from it is that they're trying to be nice and trying to care for me. Everything else, it just seems. I know it sounds harsh. It's just their 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 way of dealing with it just seems worthless to me. It doesn't help because I'm not going to trick my mind into thinking there's some afterlife just to feel better. I don't believe in that. I, I, I always I don't like emotions overriding like reason. I've always been against that. You could have asked my wife when she was alive. She was. She said I was. She said that I had the eternal contradicting personality. That um, I was when it came to like like um, dealing with actual real things. I basically would turn off my emotions and just deal with it from a very logical frame of reference. And, but she she was shocked that I could be that cold and calculating with things, but still cry when I see somebody die in my favorite movies. Mm. She always yeah. said I, had the, I was the coldest, coldest, most compassionate person she's ever met, she said. Yeah, and that's, that's something that I think is a common misconception that you can only be one or the other, right? You can only be rational and logical, or you can feel emotions deeply. And a lot that's simply not true. You can be both. Nick, I think that for me, what I'm my, my, the thing that I want to convey to you uh, more than anything else is a, you don't need to have all the answers right now. You don't need to worry about doing everything right. You don't need to worry that there is something that you should be saying that you're not. Be honest with your daughter as much as you can. Find people who can support you if you don't feel like you can cry in front of her. Make sure that there's somebody who you can cry with. And if you have family members who are pushing a narrative onto you through the, you know, through the kindness of their heart uh, in the best of intentions, even even then, if it's not something that is helping you, if it's something that is making things harder for you, you have the right to ask them to stop doing that. Say that, okay, I, I understand we are approaching this differently. I respect your 
uh, your right to mourn this person in the way that you want, in the way that makes you feel the best, please respect my choices in how I'm mourning for my wife. So making sure that you have that support network and also are setting some boundaries, um, not just for you, but for your daughter as well. And, and maybe what, what exactly is okay and acceptable to talk with her about in addition. Um, and lastly, I think I just want to plug uh, the Secular Therapy Project, um, which uh, if if at any point in time you 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 see that okay I'm going to need to talk to somebody maybe uh, professionally about this which is always a good idea, um, the Freedom from Religion Foundation um, has partnered with the, the Secular Therapy Project to uh, put you in touch with therapists in your area who are secular who won't come at you with any any religion any woo uh, they will be there for you as a support network so definitely check them out as well I'd like to add also just uh, don't be afraid don't be afraid to set boundaries um, I am wondering though was your wife religious do do they perhaps think that they have an obligation to sort of pick up where she left off or was she more in line with where you stood? Um, my wife, I call, it's kind of weird. I call her the compassionate, like nihilist. She mm. didn't really care about anything. It wasn't until she met me that she actually called herself an atheist. She said she never really even cared about the question. She didn't, mm. care, she didn't really care about a whole, like she, the only thing she thought mattered was to make people happy. And the only thing that she thought had any value is seeing people happy around her. She didn't have see any value in questioning whether, like, she didn't think it was an important subject. She just said, I don't believe in a God. I just, I just really don't care. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> she said, like, when she, she, she was raised in a hardcore Catholic, they were, they were like legit classic Italian family hardcore catholic and uh her grandmother actually told her that she was going to hell the first time because my wife was disabled because she tried she jumped off of a bridge and got ran over by two cars at the bottom and her grandmother first thing she said to her was that she was going to hell for it mm. so, okay so well, it, sounds, it sounds like she catholic it, sounds, it sounds like she is a really caring, was a really caring, loving person. And, you know, I think you're, you're doing the right thing by soliciting some advice on how to respond to this. And, and that might be the way to go forward is talk to other people who are non-believers who may have kids. And there's some disagreement about how, how to raise these, these children. This, this is a common theme that we see in the atheist community. Um, one parent is religious and the other one is not. And how do we raise these kids? Um, of course your, your situation, I think just happened a little bit more suddenly. And I'm really sorry that that happened. Yeah. And it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm on the back end of it. I'm still having these moments where I just want to break down, but it's, it's getting easier now. I was mm -hmm. a whole lot worse for the first, I was, I was, I was inconsolable. I couldn't have my daughter here for the first three mm. days of it. Uh, That's I'm understandable. Glad you're doing as much time with this as you need. This isn't something again that has a, a a set time limit. This isn't something that you need to be okay with in a month. Uh, this is going to be a long process, and it there might not be clear cut right or wrong answers, yeah. um, and that's okay. This is this is the reason religions were invented was to deal with exactly the feelings that you're feeling right now because they are so powerful and they are so intense. And as humans, we need we need to feel like we understand what's happening and and be able to categorize things. Um, so we, as atheists, kind of have that extra viewpoint of okay, this is this is not this is a big thing, and it's it's impacted the way our society has been shaped. These exact feelings that you're feeling right now. Um, but as you as you move through this, as you have conversations with your family and with your daughter, um, definitely give us a call back and let us know how things are going. Let us know if you have additional questions. Um, we'd be happy to continue to talk to you next week. Yeah, I was. I was the only thing that's going to be hard. I don't know what's going to go because I'm letting. I told them they could have whatever ceremony they have, and they're having a 
like a small like c- ceremony with a Baptist minister. We don't we didn't care about. I just wanted them to be able to do whatever they need to do to grieve. I didn't really care. I just mm-hmm. the only thing we talked about was having her cremated and me having her ashes, which she's her father's going to hand off to me at the end of the the ceremony that they have. I mean, I I didn't. I just want. I, I'm just trying to do what she wanted. I'm trying to sort of let her last wishes be known because she talked extensively about this stuff. Hmm. Yeah. Like what she wanted to have done because her life expectancy was actually next year. Hmm. She was. She was told that she her life expectancy was 33. Died at 32. Oh, wow. Hmm. Wow. So, wow, that's terrible. Uh, yeah. So. I'm just letting them have their Baptist cer- ceremony for her because that's what, like I said, she didn't really care about the question. Mm-hmm. She just wanted people to be happy, and I want them to be able to deal with it whatever way that helps them. But yeah. I, I just don't know what to tell them when they start saying, I was like, you know, Nick, that she's in heaven running with her brother, and I'm just... Uh, um, I just, I just, like, yeah. I, I don't want to tell this person who's grieving this way, no, that that's silly. Yeah. Even though I do think yeah. that, I'm just trying to hold my tongue. Right, and that that makes you a, a good person. That makes you an empathetic person. Um, and you don't need to get into a debate about whether or not it it heaven exists or 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 how rational the belief is. All you need to say is. I appreciate you trying to comfort me. I need to grieve with this in my own way. Please, let's talk about something else. And yeah, you can um, accommodate people, but you also, I think it's going to be healthy to set some boundaries. Yeah. How far are you willing to let them go when it comes to, like, you may say, okay, you can dump every, all that religious stuff on me, but not around my daughter. That might be a good compromise, but, uh, it sounds like you're walking a really fine line of establishing some boundaries, but also accommodating them and not, mm-hmm. not um, preventing them from dealing with her death in their own way. And I think that that's really good. I just hope that they afford you the same in return. Right. Thank you so much for calling, Nick. I really appreciate it. And I, uh, my thoughts are with you and your family. Yeah, Nick. Thanks, Nicholas. Right. Thank you. You have a nice day. Call us back Me with too. an update if you get a chance. Yes, please do. Wow. Tough, tough Oof, situation. Yeah. Heavy first Ooh. call. Yeah. But yeah, no, this is not, it's not uncommon. Uh, at least a couple times a month, uh, we'll get a, a call very similarly t- similar to this on the show. Either it's, uh, we have different ideas of, of what religion is, how do we tell this to our children, um, or very often it is grief. It is her grandmother died or her mother died or, you know, some relative close to them is no longer with us. And how do we, how do we talk about that? Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel I massively think, underqualified as somebody who doesn't have children. I know. But, well, yeah. But it, even with children, I'm still struggling too. Like, Oh, what can I say to Nicholas to, to try to make this tough situation better? But Sometimes there's no words other than just acknowledging the situation, mm-hmm. putting down some boundaries, taking a stand, but also being flexible so that the other, the other people that were in her life can also feel that they are celebrating her life and and dealing with her death in the appropriate way. But it's yeah, it's tough. It makes me. Uh, is there a white paper? Or has anyone written in an article? Maybe somebody can put that in the live chat. Yeah. If you're if you're aware of a of a a blog, maybe or. Um, some sort of article on how atheists deal with grief might be a really interesting thing to to send off to Nicholas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If anybody has a resource, uh, definitely pop that in the chat or the comments. Um, we'll take a look at it, and, and uh, if we like it, incorporated into you know what we can give them. Because at this point, we have recovering from religion, we have mm-hmm. uh, the secular therapy project, we do have these connections with other organizations that are there to help. Um, but we're always looking to expand our library, expand our resources, so that we can give people the the stuff they need. On that note, then I, I don't feel bad about mentioning a, a secret Facebook group. It's secret. You know, like it won't show up in your list of groups if you're on Facebook and you join this group, but it's called Emerging Faith. And it's for people who are atheists, who are married to non to believers. They're still mm. believers. 
Uh, I guess it doesn't have to be just if you're surrounded by believers, but you're a non-believer, it's a great online community. Send an email to emergingfaithhelp at gmail.com. We'll vet you and then we'll add you to the group. Um, it's very small, but that intimacy has some advantages too. So it might be something to check out. Oh, good. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. we'll definitely make sure that's in the description as well so that people can oh. find it there. Thank you, awesome. Anthony. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on uh, to Sean in Minnesota. Hello, Sean. Sean, hi. What's going hi, on today? Hi. Uh, I'm doing well. Awesome. Um, what can is we help up? you with? I'm an individual that moves back and forth between theism and atheism, um, mostly for the social reasons. <laughs> and um, as I kind of try to, the, to, to the atheist the, side for the social reasons, right? Yes, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, in, the, in, in trying to reconcile this for my, myself, I, I see God, God's religion and religious ideas, they're all social constructs. Um, and the idea that we have to have this argument of to believe or to not believe seems to be some kind of false dichotomy that really doesn't lead anywhere. Um, and it kind of digresses into my way is better than your way. Um, all the time, and everybody goes off in the corners, and we agree to disagree. So, I, it, it, why is aren't we able to have a discussion that isn't so divisive? That simply acknowledges that religion and gods are part of our history, a shared history as humans, um, and I, the coping and social mechanisms that were required to survive thousands of years ago. They are what they are. And the books document what they are. And we don't need to you know, get all uh, wrapped around the axle arguing about them. And some of them don't apply mm -hmm. anymore. Well, so I, I have several thoughts on, on this. <laughs> um, on, on the one hand, I'd say one of the reasons we can't have a conversation about that is try telling that to a theist. <laughs> um, but also, I think that it's great that Anthony's here um, because this is kind of his forte, um, having these conversations in a productive way that don't send people spinning off to their separate corners angry at each other. <laughs> um, so I will give this over to him in a minute. Uh, I did just want to uh, address one thing. Uh, I can't speak for all atheists, of course, of course, of course, I can only speak for myself um, and for the limited number of people with whom I've had this conversation. But I don't think there are many atheists who deny the fact that religion and gods are part of our history or are a cultural phenomenon or are a social construct that at one point may have been more useful than they are now. Um, so if that's the kind of person you're talking with, that's very interesting. Get them to call the show and we'll have a conversation with them. Um, I think that the issue, uh, the reason we have these heated debates and the reason that there is this contention, at least from my point of view, is because often there is a right way and a wrong way to do things. Um, my way is better than your way can be nitpicky and, and divisive for no reason, or it can be, hey, I don't think we should be stoning people for being gay. That is objectively a better way to be. Um, so a lot of the time, yes, it can be, especially if you're thinking about like online debates on Twitter or in the YouTube comments, yes, it's going to sound divisive and nitpicky and just getting on each other's nerves for the heck of it. But the larger conversation is important. And as long as that is a, a conversation that needs to be had. I think we need to have it. Um, but I'm going to pass this off to Anthony to talk about how to have these conversations in a in a non-aggressive way. Well, yeah. Well, when you when you first started, you were talking about how you thought that the social aspects are what's keeping people maybe into the religion. Was that what you were saying? Well, was that it, was that sort it, of your main yeah. argument? Well, I'm not, I don't want to assert an argument. And what I'm trying to do is share my experience, which is a little different. Um, <laughs> and in the work that I do, I'm, I'm probably, um, you're, you're really like my kid's age. Um, so in my career and the things that I do in the world, the um, being affiliated or not hostile to religions and religious people 
is a social advantage. It helps. It, and if I were to take the opposite perspective, it would turn combatic, combatant, and I wouldn't be as successful doing what I do. I think that's a that's a palpable, real thing to have conversations about. Um, but in the, it, it's tough to find an audience that is able to have that conversation. Yeah, you can't force anyone to have a conversation that they don't want to have. So you need a willing participant. So if if these folks are willing to talk with you about why they think that they have the truth or their religion is is the one true religion or that the the social advantages that you get from following my God supersede all the other ones. Um, mm -hmm. If they're not willing to have that talk with you, of course, you really can't do it. You can try. It's not, you're probably not going to get very far, or they may just troll you to let you think, make you think that you're actually having a conversation with them. So what I would just simply do is ask a person if they're willing to explore their claim with you. Why do you think you're getting value from this that you couldn't otherwise get elsewhere? Um, but again, if they're not willing to talk with you about it, you're not going to get very far. Well, what happens is, is this this place that I'm at that they say, hey, if you find somebody, let's talk to them. I'm one of these people. Let's mm -hmm. try to find this common. You need two willing. You need at least two willing people, though. So just because you're willing doesn't mean that they're willing. And it, it, it right. may be they they might be unwilling to engage with you because I, I don't want to, you know. Believe me, I've had horrible engagements with people. But if you've argued with people in the past, they may be less willing to engage with you, maybe because you made them look stupid or you gave them some facts that they couldn't counter or something like that. Um, if you have a history with a person, then that might even be a reason why they don't want to engage with you. But if you can find a willing participant and you can engage with them asking questions and, and push back on their religious claims, um, you can certainly do it. We do that on this show. We do that in street epistemology all the time. Sean, are you are you making the case that we shouldn't be having these conversations and just go along to get along? Um, uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, and that's good. I, my, I, <laughs> but when I have these conversations, what I find is I'm trying to take this kind of soft middle ground and now I'm fighting both sides. And it's like, well, this is, I find that an interesting response because um, I'm not trying to assert there is a, a, a deity and I'm not trying to assert there is not a deity. I'm just trying to assert that, hey, look, this is a common history. We can't demonstrate it either way um, and, and until somebody does that that's the state that we're in. So what point is it to try to have an argument of, uh, my way is better because I can show you that um, God does actually exist. And there's all kinds of weird arguments in that place that really don't make any sense. Um, um, well, if you haven't looked into street epistemology yet, there might be something to look into because you, when you use that approach of asking questions, you generally don't need to reveal your position or take a side. You can have a position, mm -hmm. you can have a side, and you can even reveal it but you don't necessarily have to. And you can use the exact same questioning approach with somebody who thinks that God is real and somebody who thinks that God isn't real. So it, it might be a, a tool that you might actually be really geared for that tool, especially you know if you're kind of the kind of person that, you know, I don't really want to fight for, really hard for a position, but I might want to push back a little bit on what somebody's saying. All right, all right, but to, to V's point, are you ambivalent about the, the whole thing? Do you sort of look at the arguments that, going, that are going back and forth and you're like, I just don't want to have anything to do with it? Or are you the type of person who, who does want to get involved and engage with people and challenge them when they say something? What kind of person are you? I, I, I used to be much more combative. <laughs> and let, let's, let's have a throwdown and really resolve this. As, as I've gotten older, I, it's more of, okay, um, uh, peace in the household has more value to me than being right. Uh, and so the, hmm. the social aspect of it, okay, what is the pragmatic um, outcome that, and, and what, how are we going to talk about this from a social perspective? And uh, V, you brought up the, um, the, you know, the history of religion against gay people. That is, that is, for me, that is tragic. And the books document what people used to think and what used to be, what people used to do 
We know much more now. We're more civilized. We don't need those laws. And there's evidence in there that says um, homosexuality has been around humans as long as there's been humans, basically. It's not an aberration. It's not an abomination. Let's get over these antiquated social constructs. So it sounds, well, it sounds like I, you do care. No, see, here's the thing. I agree with you, uh, definitely, that if we look at this book as, hey, this is something we used to believe as a, as a society, we don't believe that anymore. The only reason that we're not still right there is because of the conversations about whether or not there's a God and why we should be holding certain values over others. So I get where you're coming from, that there is there should be a middle ground in terms of, you know, a uh, hard atheism and hard theism, and I personally fall in that middle ground too. I am. I don't know, um, and I'm not going to argue that. Yes, there certainly is no God because that's a positive claim that I don't think I can back up. But um, to say that we need to not have these kinds of conversations that are combative is to me counterintuitive if you're pointing at how far humanity has come we've come this far because we've had these hard and often combative conversations no yeah i i i, I hear what you're saying and and i agree the thing that i find frustrating is why can't we have a rational conversation why can't, why does it need to be combative we can just actually talk oh. through as a that are reasonable and rational and go oh, well, i see a, any any parent that would forsake their child for whatever reason, that's kind of despicable. So well, we we get humans get really particular about the beliefs that we hold, and of course we act out on the beliefs that we hold, and we think that we're good people because of the beliefs that we hold. So pushing back on these beliefs, I think, are really important because. Whether you argue and you uh, debate or you use a, a Socratic approach like street epistemology or anything else, this is the way that we challenge the views of the people around us so that we can make the world a little bit of a better place for the other people who will come after us. Mm -hmm. So while you yourself may be at this point in your life a little ambivalent about it, like, ah, I don't really see the whole point of all this arguing. But um, there are a lot of people who do, and and maybe maybe just sitting on the sidelines for a little bit, and seeing the different types of conversation that people are having about those topics, where they're productive, they really can be productive, if you go about it in the right way with the person that you happen to be speaking with. So getting a, getting an idea of not only do I have a willing participant, but where do I need to meet this person? What type of approach will they respond to best? Is extremely important because. You may use a soft approach with somebody who might respond better to facts and debate. So you really need to have a little bit of an engagement to assess how do I meet them? And maybe in some situations, the best, the best decision is to not engage with them. But for the most part, generally, pushing back on claims that people make is what we need to do to make this world a better place. Mm -hmm. But I understand as you're going through life, and it may not be the best time for you to do it at this moment. Um, there are people who are willing to do that. And I hope that you look into some of the other methods that are available to you, because I suspect, I suspect if you looked into something like street epistemology or Socratic questioning, what they do here on the show, you're watching a show where they do that. So, yeah. well, let me ask you, have you, I actually wanted to ask you, were you always an atheist? No, I, I don't know if that I am now. Hmm. <laughs> Um, Could, I, I, would, uh, would you like uh, to know, would you like to know if you're an atheist or a theist? Do you care? Actually, I don't care. You don't care. Here, here's a saying, here, here's, a, here's a test that I, I give in the discussions I have with folks. Okay. Say, for example, just for sake of discussion, tomorrow they prove God exists. What, what would you change in your beliefs and your behaviors? Okay. <laughs> right. right. Would our lives change in any way if God was real or not real? How would it change? And if, if we can't really come up with a good answer, I could understand why you might be like, well, I don't really care about that. I don't really care about that answer. But a lot of other people do care about what that answer is, and they act out on it. And they want laws yeah. to, be, to be enacted because of where they stand on those claims. So even though we may be ambivalent about it, we don't care about it, um, there's a hell of a lot of people that do, man. And, right. and, and that's what, we, we can't let people just walk all over us. We have to push back. 
And that's why I reject Islam, because Islam is kind of goes backwards from where Christianity was trying to go thousands of years ago. It's, so so it, it seems like... Well, it, now we're getting into a whole other topic, which uh, I, we should definitely... I mean, I'm curious about this as well, but I think we may need to save that for another call. Um, but I... I don't know. I, I I think well well what you describe yourself as is probably closest to an apatheist. You are apathetic mm. about theism, whether it, there is a god or there isn't. Um, I don't necessarily. I, I'm happy that you have reached that place because in a perfect world, that's where we'd all be. We all would be. Eh, who cares? Who fucking cares? Um, but the only way we're going to get there and pr create a society where people have the the privilege of being apathetic about whether or not there is a God is if we have those hard conversations and argue and potentially make each other angry sometimes. So I'm not saying that always needs to be the case. I'm not saying every theist you talk to, you need to, or atheist you talk to, you need to have this conversation about by any means. I have many atheist friends and many theist friends, and we don't talk about religion all the time. In fact, hardly ever. Um, so I'm not saying that that's a requirement for relationships with atheists or theists. I am saying that saying, well, why can't we all just get along is great, and that's where we want to go eventually, but we're not there yet. And the only way we get there is by caring enough to combat the people who want to take those rights away from us. Yeah, no, I, 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 I get that. Um, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the church I'm affiliated with, um, um, I got them to start a skeptics discussion where we started talking about, okay, all the stuff that doesn't make any sense and how, how does this stuff still reconcile? That was great for a while. Then it got to the point where, wow, I'm actually casting doubt on things and they shut, shut everything down. Okay, so they don't really, they're not really interested in, understanding what, what really happened so no 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 i, I no, wouldn't I, I, would, I wouldn't conflate the two just because someone is expressing doubt and they want to end the talk it's not necessarily an indication that they are ambivalent about it or they don't care about it either you're probably hitting a nerve with them and mm -hmm. you're causing them to think about something that's very core to who they are and of course we act out on the beliefs that we hold so i, I wouldn't sell yourself short uh, you may be misinterpreting the reactions that you're getting from people when you do engage with them and you're, I don't know, I'm wondering if you're engaging with people and you're noticing their reactions and you're thinking, oh, they don't care about it. And therefore you're not caring about it either because you're thinking that they don't. Is that the case? That, that could be. I, I, I haven't, I haven't, oh, I haven't put that much thought into it. We just start things and you kind of see where they go and they run out of gas. And, okay. There's, <laughs> there's, this is not fertile, ground for this conversation and kind of let it die um, and then start it up in some other context. Um, yeah. The other thing too, I, I found is that you don't always have to be talking about a sensitive topic like God with somebody who may give you that reaction of while you're asking me questions, I'm starting to doubt, let's change the subject or let's not ever talk about this again. And maybe mistakenly give you the impression that they don't care about the topic. You can talk about safer topics and still challenge the person about it. And uh, you may notice a different reaction when you talk about paper bags versus plastic as opposed to God. More than likely, people do care, um, but you may be scaring them off by the questions and the interactions that you're having, especially if it's with a theist and they can't back up their claim. Mm -hmm. Thank you for calling. Um, we do need to jump to other callers, uh, Sean, because we're, we're getting a, getting pretty close to the top of the Thanks, hour. Sean. But uh I do appreciate the conversation. I do think that uh, we can afford to be able to play in the middle ground a little bit more and, and see things from each other's point of view. Um, but we do still need to have those hard conversations if we want progress to happen. So thank you. And if you do want to call back, uh, I'll be here next week. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. And if Sean or anyone else is not willing to have those conversations, there are lots of people who are. We're on the exactly. Discord server. We're on shows like this. There's a whole host of people who want to talk to you about why you think God is real. And we have all different styles. So if it's not your cup of tea at this particular time in your life, send them our way. All right. Let's talk with Kevin in New York. Kevin wants to talk about the pineal gland in the brain. Hi, Kevin. How can we help you today? 
Hey, how's it going? Hey, it's Colin. going. All right. What can we help right. you? Um, well, um, not just having to do with the pineal gland um, and how I was going to talk about how one could uh, reach the conclusion that we have a soul through researching uh, the pineal gland of the brain. Interesting. Um, what is, is well, so that's, that's the claim we're running with, that the pineal gland somehow is uh, proof of the soul? Well, yeah. Yeah, because um, uh, even from a very long time ago, it, it mysteriously seemed like without the medical capabilities of knowing that we even had such a function within our brains. The, the pineal gland is uh, located uh, directly center of our brains, and I, I believe that it was also referred to as, as a third eye or a spiritual eye. Hmm. But, um, okay, so we're talking about what it's referred to, and this is probably back before we knew what it did, right? Uh, well, yeah, but... Um, they were they were pretty close, uh, surprisingly, because from what we can tell, um, on what the pineal gland is, is that it has, um, it, if it were dissected, it would seem to have the the same inner workings that our that our eyes do. Hmm, but, that's an interesting yeah. claim. Because do, do you want to explain to the audience what a pineal gland does? And its purpose within the brain, and also your level of expertise, like from one to yes, ten. That like, too. Are, are, like <laughs> on this subject, I would put myself at a point five. At like, least, I, I, at most, yeah. it would be like a point yeah. five. Yeah. And where, where would you be, Kevin, with that? And then maybe you can answer V's question. Um, well, the pineal gland is uh, responsible for releasing certain chemicals within our brains. Um, uh, having to do with sleep, having to do with dreams, um, uh, just natural chemicals that are found within the brain. Okay. Uh, and do you study this? Is this a, is this an area of expertise for you? It's not an area of expertise, but, um, I, I do believe that this leads to exactly what I was talking about because, well, well, before I continue, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to use an example because because where someone like a, a, a Christian like me who is uh, who likes to think of um, scientific things, well, when you look at yourself in the mirror, um, you know that the person looking back at you isn't the accumulation of what you are, and so. Um, that's what, that's what gives uh, a person the, the thought of there's a ghost in the machine sort of working. The only thing we can compare it to is like uh, a battery power in a machine. I, I'm, uh, I'm lost. Uh, can we, can, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. Is this, is this supposed to help it, us understand the, the pineal gland a little bit better or cause, cause I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like we're running a little bit abroad here talking about reflections and ghosts in the machine. Mm. Maybe one way of narrowing it down would be to tell us what you think the pineal gland does. Make a claim regarding the pineal clam, pineal gland, and ask, you know, explain, you know, tell us exactly what you think this thing does, and then maybe we can challenge you a little bit about that claim. Mm -hmm. Well, um, th this definitely is a claim, but um, I believe that the pineal gland is. Uh, a, um, I, I'm sorry, I just put it this way for a lack of a better way to put it, but uh, a facilitator of the of the soul uh, on an energy level. But it also is responsible for uh, dreams, out of body experiences. Hmm. Could somebody so have some... a? Could someone have a pineal <laughs> gland and it not do any of that stuff? Um, no. It's only through um, everybody is naturally born with it, anybody with a brain. Uh, and, well, my, my question uh, was, though, could somebody have a pineal gland and it not do 
all, all, not have all the attributes that you assign to it. Like it's just, um, it's asleep or it's, it's defective in some way. It just, it's there, but it doesn't do what you think that it does. Uh, the only evidence of, uh, a pineal gland being anything separate from what it is, is, uh, just the, uh, through the natural aging process. They, they say that the pineal gland, uh, calcifies as a person ages. Hmm. Uh, so does the soul calcify as a person uh, ages? Uh, no. Okay. No, it's just, it, it just makes a clear difference between what people understand is uh, the brain and then uh, the mind. Oh, okay. The so you're talking about substance yeah. dualism. Okay. All right. All right. I think I, I understand where you're coming with this. You are saying that the pineal gland is somehow that link between what the brain does and what the mind does. And, and it's kind of like you're, you're, you're arguing that there is something outside of the brain, outside of the natural chemical and neurological processes that happen that still exists somehow within it. Yeah. Why? Yeah, and, and the, why do we why range, why do uh, we need that extra la layer? If we can say, okay, the pineal gland makes us dream because of melatonin and the production of melatonin, um, then why do we need to add also a soul on top of it? Why would we? What evidence is there for that? Well, uh, the the similarities that I'm trying to link it with is that. Well, things can be um, similar and not linked at all. I mean, you can say, well, a soul is supposed to do certain things and this other thing does certain things, but that doesn't mean they're at all linked. Well, yeah, but. Like you can I mean, say, I can get a hug and it'll make me warm and cozy and I, I can curl up in a blanket and it will also make me warm and cozy, but the blanket is not the hug, right? That's just things that are similar. So is there anything outside of, well, the way we talk about what melatonin does is similar to the way we talk about what a soul sometimes might do? Is that the extent of that link or do you have research that you want to provide us with that might prove your point? Um, well, uh, just a little bit, but I mean, this is all according to, uh, what type of information people are looking into because I'm, I'm coming from a, a point of view in this argument where, um, uh, there are energetic, uh, vibrational frequencies, um, uh, about our reality and, and our soul is linked with that. All right. And why so, do you believe that? Um, that seems like a pretty big presupposition to bring to the table. I won't agree with anything you say if you're building it off of that, because I don't believe I don't have reason to believe that. So can we talk about that? Well, why do you think that there are energetic well, vibrational well, yeah. frequencies and what are they? Well, just, just the fact that we see colors with our with our eyes. Uh, the, the crazy thing is, is that um, depending on which vibrational frequency it is, is right, light the, waves. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, right. it's almost like it's that's the decider of what is translated by your eyes and then the brain. Okay, and so are you so saying that because our that, our eyes pick up certain kinds of waves, that means that there are other kinds of waves that our soul picks up? Or are you saying that our, um, our soul is the reason we can see color? Well, see, I, I don't have an answer for the first question you asked me. Uh, I'm gonna have to think about that. Um, yeah, because I think I think that see, here's something that that's really interesting is the reason that people who claim kind of woo sciencey things like ooh, like I can uh, like energy workers or chakra healers or, or, or anything along those lines. It's not it, they don't get bought because people are dumb, right? They get bought because people are just smart enough to know when something sounds scientific and to know when they know a little bit of science. So if you know enough science to know the reason you can see color, then if someone takes that and then twists it a little bit to give you an example of something else that they're claiming, you can say in your brain, well, 
I mean, I know that this happens with color, so who am I to say it doesn't happen here too? This person sounds authoritative, but there is a <laughs> there is a problem there, and it's not, and it's just that we can't possibly know everything about science. We know a little bit, and then you as an individual will then go out and make assumptions about what else is scientific based on how it seems to fit with your understanding. Um, but that's how they get you. <laughs> that's where the con comes in. And I'm not saying everybody who believes this stuff is, you know, actively conning. But the thing is, to say that there are light waves that we uh, interpret with our eyes and so we see color, therefore there are other waves of energy that somehow is interactive with a soul, those are still two very separate claims, right? We can observe and we can point to studies of one, the light waves, the, the, the ability to see color, but just because we can point over here doesn't give any credence to the thing over here. So what I wanna do with you now is focus on this claim that somehow there are vibrational energies that are somehow linked to a soul, whatever that is, uh, without talking about, well, it's like this other thing that's proven. We don't care if it's like the other thing that's proven, we wanna prove this thing. So do you have research? Do you have people who have studied this? How, how did you come to this conclusion? Well, um, I, I come to conclusions like this uh, naturally by myself because, uh, well, without obviously anybody telling me, uh, when we look around and we see life in general, we know that there's energy behind that life uh, unique to itself. And Is, is it important uh, for you that there is a soul? Um, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> Why? Why is it important for you to have a soul? What is a soul and why is it important for you to have it? Well, um, well, it's, it then gets uh, into a lot of deeper stuff. Like if, if a person realizes that they have a soul, you realize that other people have souls and then maybe we can have uh, a better respect for life. But it, it goes back to what I said before that, um, like, when I look in the mirror, I know that the person looking back at me is not the accumulation of what I actually am. And you're making that determination because of the pineal gland that's in your brain. Uh, that's, that's, that's just part of it. Okay. I don't know. I don't know, V. I, I, I'm actually amazed you made you made as much out of that as you were able to do. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I think it might be useful for me, and I, I don't know if you want to do it on this call or not. But understanding the relationship between these vibrations and the soul and the brain and this pineal gland and how they all interrelate, I think would probably be really helpful. And I, that that's a detail that I was lacking this entire conversation. So. Right. Maybe start maybe starting with that next time would be probably be more helpful. And then come at us with a specific claim. Humans can't do this unless they have this thing or something along those lines. I think that might be really useful. And it sounds yeah. like I mean, you kind of gave us one like humans wouldn't be able to look into a mirror and identify themselves as being more than what they see in the mirror without this pineal gland or something. That's kind of what I what I think I hear you saying. But even still, oh no! Uh, without realizing that there is a soul within the body, within their own body. But hmm. but uh, the pine the pineal gland is just a link between all of that. Well, I think that what I want to take away from this call is what you very honestly and openly uh, told us, which is I came up with this right? This is something that I came up with. I didn't hear this from someone else. This isn't someone else telling me sh something. This is just me having these thoughts. And it sounds like you have a very interesting brain. But also, I think that a little knowledge is very dangerous, if not used correctly. And it's very easy to find things that seem to be linked or seem to support an idea. But the best 
best way to determine if something is true, A, is to have conversations like this. So kudos to you for calling in um, because that's definitely a good way to bounce these conversations back and forth. Hey, how did you come up with this? Well, I was thinking about this thing. Oh, well, did you ever consider X? You know, and that's a good way to have those kinds of conversations and determine what is worth pursuing as uh, a possible truth. Um, but I would also encourage you, um, I know you've called in a couple of times, Kevin, and you always have very interesting calls. Uh, next time you come up with something, do a little bit of research. Come to us with a couple sources. Um, see if you can f hone and kind of fine tune your claims a little bit so that we can really get into the meat of the subject and, mm. and have a really good conversation with you next time. A schematic might be helpful as All well. Right. Draw it out. How does this, what are you envisioning <laughs> and how does it work? And then take us through your little drawing. <laughs> Well, well, thank you. I, I mean, I appreciate the, the conversation. I, I mean, it's, it's very respectful. Uh, it, it's a good debate. Thank you. All yeah. Right. Thank you for calling. Yeah. Thanks for calling. Bye, Kevin. I'm sorry, V. I, I don't, I didn't really know what, you know, what to really do with that other than try to figure out what the claim was and what, what exactly is the relationship of all these, these, uh, these items, some of which mm -hmm. seem to be real and some of which don't seem to be real. Right. It's kind of difficult to parse a sentence where pineal gland and soul are used with equal like assuredness <laughs> in said sentence. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. Kevin's called a couple times. He's talked about Ouija boards. He's talked about uh, the the star of Wormwood and Revelation. So he's he's had some interesting theories. So I think at this point, I'm able to come at his conversation worrying more about like, how he comes up with these things <laughs> and is he doing okay. research before coming on the show? But I really do appreciate um, your feedback there because I, I do enjoy being able to pivot from uh, methodology to motivation, right? And I think that we did both on that call. So we, we talked about why we were using mm -hmm. a particular method and how do we researched it, but also do we care that there's a soul and why and, and what motivation do you have for even coming up with this in the first place? So thank yeah. you so much. All right, uh, we've got a couple of theists on the line, which is exciting. Let's talk to Adrian in Texas. Hi, Adrian. Uh, did I actually hit the button? Let's, let's hit the button again. All right, Adrian Hi, in Texas. Yes. Hello, Hi, how are you? Yes, it's such a uh, honor to speak to Anthony Magnabasco and, and V. It's a, um, can, what can we help you with today? Our good I know that you don't have a lot of time, so I'll just start from the uh, beginning. Since this is the first time I've talked to Anthony, um, I believe in a designer God because of the uh, evidence around us that appears to be designed, like the uh, the moon and see if there's DNA and the uh, distance that the Earth is from the sun and the uh, position, the tilt of the Earth and uh, the uh, uh, magnetic field and the ozone layer. Mm, those are certainly all things. Oh. Um, so let's pick one. Let's pick, because because at this point, we're going to be like, uh, we're going to be shooting all over the place if we're trying to talk about all of this. And of course, neither of us are scientists. I don't think, Anthony, unless you have a degree that you're not. Uh, I don't have a about. degree. No, I don't have a degree in that field, unfortunately. But I'm, I'm a little curious. Why is this your le is this your go to argument to show that God is real? Is this the the knockout drag down argument that you have to support your claim? Were you less sure God was real before you discovered this argument? Why are we talking about this argument first? Okay, we well, get a lot of calls first, about the designer first, argument on these shows. That was a lot of questions there. Can you kind of narrow it down to one there, or maybe? How important is this reason for you thinking that God is real? How important is this reason? Mm -hmm. you if, if, right, we, you're if, calling if we, in. If, if we spent the last the next twenty minutes talking about the designer yeah. argument, and and you, you 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 came to the realization that this is not a good argument, I need to stop using this. Would you be less sure God was real? But um, that sounds different from the first question, but. I, what, I thought from the first question you were asking me, maybe like if it's a hobby or like a hobby to me to go looking for God. Like, no, no, no. It, it is no. a hobby to me. No, that, thought, that wasn't it. I'm trying to assess how important this reason is for you thinking God is real. 
And if this is a big reason that would impact your confidence, if we discovered that it's a bad reason, then I want to talk about it. But if it's not going to impact your confidence, I do want to talk. I want to talk about something else. But um, yeah, I'm I'm curious. Before we spend all this time talking about the design argument, which has been done a lot on this show and other ACA shows, which we can do, I just want to know if we're actually talking about something that would impact your confidence that God was real. Uh, yes, yes, I think it would, and and okay. and I would appreciate it if you didn't. I mean. Uh, if you didn't um, like kind of pile me in with everyone else, because I have my own thoughts and, and uh, they might be different from what you've heard before. That's a fair point. If it, it very well be, it'd be different. I may have just made an assumption that you're, that you're going to give us a typical sort of design argument. But uh, the point here though, it sounds like is that this argument is important for you thinking God is real. And if that's the case, then I, I'm definitely interested in going down that road with you. So sure. Awesome. Okay, so yeah, let's uh, let's start this conversation then, and I will kind of let Anthony lead this since it says in the notes that you're a big fan of Anthony. So I'll let you guys have a conversation, but I do want to make sure that maybe we we focus on where you differ from the argument. So you you said you said please don't let me in with other people. I have my own thoughts about this argument. We have heard the designer argument many times, and we have our standard way that we go about talking about that. But if you have a different take, or if, if, if you're bringing something new to the table, um, that is something that I know I'd be interested in hearing. So let's kind of focus this onto uh, one portion of the designer argument, whether you wanna talk about the moon or the tilt of the earth or tides or DNA or any of those things, let's pick one and then I'll let you guys have at it. Sounds good. Sure, sure, I guess I'll, I'll go first. Um, since you know I gotta present my evidence first, so, um, uh, I know there's a lot of evidence that points to uh, a designer in nature, but we could start with uh, DNA because there's uh, experts like Richard Dawkins that are saying that it are comparing it to um, computer science. Okay. So I know I said I was going to let Anthony take this. And I will, I promise, <laughs> Anthony, ahead. you will. Yeah, but ahead. I do want to just make sure, once and for all, guys, stop pulling that quote out of context. If you read The Blind Watchmaker, if you read the book, then you would know for sure where he was coming with that quote. Uh, you are pulling half of that quote and not the second half where he says, but it is not designed. It is not code. It is not computer code. Um, so... We understand that you're trying to get that in because you're like, oh, well, Dawkins says this. A, I don't really care what Dawkins says. Like, he was fun to read when I was coming out of the faith, but like, I don't, I don't wait to hear the next thing that comes out of his mouth. So I may just disagree with him. But second, uh, it's a dishonest tactic. Uh, so once and for all, we had this a couple weeks ago. We had this a month ago. This keeps coming up. Let's 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 cut it with the quote. Uh, continue. <laughs> Okay. Yes, I, I I realize you think that I'm taking it out of context, and I would just like to know uh, what kind of what context do you think I should take that in when he says that something appears to be designed? And, and I think you're kind of taking it out of context because he didn't say that it wasn't designed. That he said that he doesn't know why All it right. looks designed. We don't really care what anyone said, even Richard Dawkins. Okay, so. The, the 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 key thing here though is why do you think it's important enough to bring up? Is right. it part of your is if it's part of your argument, then tell us what you think this guy said and why we should consider it as being useful for giving your argument more weight or something. Okay, okay, yes, and and all other kind of arguments all over the world, um, whenever there's an expert that is biased in the the opposite direction. And then he says something that is the, uh, you know, he's saying that it appears to be designed, but he doesn't even believe in, in a God, right? I think that is the most important, I mean, the most uh, convincing thing to me. because So you're pinning your argument different. about the designer God on a Richard Dawkins quote? That seems risky. Half I of a Richard Dawkins quote? Because if we're not moving on from the quote, if we get hung up on this, then I'm going to move on to the next caller because we've had this conversation. Uh, if you want to stay on the call and talk with Anthony, I highly recommend you move on to the next topic. 
Can I repeat back what I think you're saying, Adrian? I think you're Absolutely. saying, I think you're saying, I think you're saying, this is what I think you're saying. Because it looks designed, we're justified in thinking it's designed. Yes, sir. That's exactly that, what I'm saying. That's, that's what you're saying. That That's the argument. Is that it? Wow. Yes, sir. I think we're, we are justified in, um, in, uh, let's see, everything appears to be the way, I guess my first premise would be everything appears to be the way it is until proven otherwise, or everything is the way it appears to be until proven otherwise. I'm sorry. Ooh. If we, if we, if we realize that we have, if we realize that we have no way of demonstrating otherwise, does it make sense to accept the initial premise? I think so. Like, like say if I were to, um, act, if I were to think that V was a, a man or something, then, you know, uh, would it be, would I be justified in believing that V was a man before I actually found out that she was a woman? Let's, let's, well, pick it, I, I was thinking of a different topic here. I was thinking of something simple, like wow. you know, what, when I, if you'll allow me, sorry, continue. Um, I mean, I was thinking like putting a Turkey in the oven and you think that it's done because it sure looks Brown and it's been in there for four hours. And when I open up the oven, this blast of heat hit me. Um, it looks like it's done, but let's say that my thermometer for sticking it into the carcass and taking the inner temperature is not working or I lost it. I think it's your position that we should, we would be fine accepting the, our perception that based on the appearance that the Turkey is done, but because I don't have a way to test it, I'm fine accepting it to be the case. Yes, if you have enough things that appear to be uh, done about the turkey, like if there's, you know, uh, burnt knees or something, I don't know, with a burnt thigh or whatever, uh, then you know that, or if you push it a certain way with your finger or something, then you know that, that that makes it done. Or if you maybe throw it against the wall and it sticks or something. And, uh, <laughs> like you know, spaghetti. That way yeah. So what you're describing, yeah. are, you're describing things that we can do to demonstrate that our hypothesis is either factually correct or not. And if we, would it be wise to serve that turkey to people? I guess we could still do it, right? And people can get sick. But would it be wise to say undeniably that turkey is done because I can actually observe it and it seems like the oven's working and all that? Does it make sense to conclude that something is true when we can't verify it to be the case? Even though it may look yeah, like it is the case. Things. If there's enough things, I, I think we're justified. Okay. So how did you look at the universe or you look around you, you look at the trees, you notice design. Um, you realize perhaps that you actually can't test it to see that it's not the case, but you're just going to go with it anyways. Why are you even taking a position on it? Why, why wouldn't you say, I'm not exactly sure oh. why this has the appearance of design? Why? That's what I'm curious about. Oh. Generally, when I meet people who make yeah. this argument and honestly, what you're telling uh -huh. me is not different than what we hear from other people about the design argument. I hate to break it to you, but, um, why? Yeah. So can you, can you answer that question please for me? Yes. I, I, uh, let me see. Dang it. I forgot the question. Go ahead. It was... Oh, um, why are you going the extra step to say, it looks designed and therefore I'm going to conclude that it was, and it's this specific God. You didn't go that far yet, but, and it's this specific God that designed it. Why can't you say, well, it sure looks like that Turkey's done. Oh, oh okay. I remember, but that. I'm not, remember. but I'm not exactly yeah, sure I, why, I, why do you go, why do you <clears> go the extra step to, to give it an explanation? Yeah. I'm okay with saying, I don't know. I just feel like the time to say, I don't know is when you have zero evidence to go by it. And I just feel like I'm far from that at this point. Yeah, you look and around, you, you yeah, see, you, yeah, you, if I understand right, evidence to you is looking around and seeing what looks like the appearance of design. That's good enough to say that it was designed. Oh, yes. Right. And I, I listed some of the things earlier. I don't know if you... You it. did, yeah. What, what, what are people who don't think that this is designed or say, you know what? Sure, freaking looks designed. 
but I'm not going to go that far to say it definitely was designed. What are they missing? Take me through it. What are people who don't go the step that you're going through and saying, well, it is designed. Mm -hmm. What are we missing? Why aren't we, what's holding us back from joining you to say it was designed? Yes. And I'm not saying that everybody can see it. Like, um, there's everybody, you know, there's blind people, there's people that can't see things. And, uh, those people, they have to rely on the people that can see things and on the experts that are saying that they can also see the, the, the design in that. As far as I know, uh, physically, Adrian and V and myself, we're, we're probably all about the same in terms of our mental abilities and our physical abilities, I suppose. What are we missing? What are we lacking what, where we're not? And I'm, I don't think V's, I think V and I are on the same page here. What are we missing? Why are you going the extra step? What, what's holding us back from joining you to say that was definitely designed? Well, I, what I thought an atheist was, was uh, someone that lacked the evidence in order to believe. So that's why I'm here is to give you, is to uh, present that evidence so that maybe you have a chance to believe. Hold on a second. You. Your evidence was the appearance of design. That was good enough for you to say it's designed. We're not there. I might even say, you know what? Kind of looks designed. All those people who are calling into the ACA shows. Eh. Kind of looks designed a little bit to me, but I'm not willing to say that it is. Bring, help me get to your position where I can say, you know what? Freak it. Yeah, it's designed. What am I missing to get to your, what do I need? What do you need? Um, mm -hmm. You just need the, I guess. What do you, what do you have? Let me rephrase it. What do you have that's brought you to the conclusion other than you observing it, observing it and saying, well, it looks designed. Is that all you have? Are you are you looking at design and saying, "Yep, it looks designed. That's good enough for me," or is there something more that you're bringing to it? Is it as simple as that? Yeah, that's are all you, I've presented you... so far. Yeah, that, yeah, it is. It is that simple. I think. I mean, uh, uh, it's supposed to be simple. I mean, uh, things that are, you know, uh, usually things that are the right, you know, uh, the right thing. It's it's simple. The answers are usually simple. Do you think that the conclusion that you're arriving at is not as well supported as you would like it to be? Do you wish that you had better evidence than well, the evidence that you're currently using? Well, that, that's why I presented to atheists. I think they would be the best um, best to, to uh, I guess, be skeptical about my evidence and give me the best, um, uh, I guess, feedback on it. Well, if I understand right, your evidence right. is it looks that way. So I'm going to just think that it is. Okay. Is that right? So I, like I'm a piston model. Do we, we wrong about that? Or? Well, here's, here's my, my question for you, Adrian. It feels to me like you don't actually want your evidence evaluated skeptically, because if you did, you would do research and talk to scientists, right? You wouldn't call into a random show with oh. two people who don't have science degrees to talk about your scientific claim. If you were really serious about trying to get to oh. the bottom of whether or not this was good evidence, then you'd have more than half of a Dawkins quote, right? So there's a different yeah. reason why yeah, I'm, I, I watch, I'm just calling you out on that. I watch more shows than just talk heathen. I mean, uh, oh, yeah, I yeah, sure. But have, you're calling uh, in to talk to science. us. And as, as cool as Anthony and I are, we're not going to be able to give you all of the scientific reasons why your particular claims may or may not be as simple as they sound. So, okay. okay. Adrian, can I try one more thing? Let me just try one more thing before we get to another I, call here. I want to, well, I, I'm going to plug yeah, on. Let me, to, let, 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 let me bulldoze okay. through this just to get this out. Um, Go ahead. Gosh, I hope I didn't forget it. Um, crap. I think oh, I no. forgot it. but it was something about okay. design. Um, okay, I know what I was going to say. Could something could something natural could something naturally occurring appear to be designed? Something naturally occurring appear to be designed. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, but you would have to have evidence to prove it. You need evidence to prove that. 
do you need more evidence yeah. to would, would you need evidence to prove your conclusion yeah right like I, so I think, you look you look at something and it appears to be designed it, if i understand your point if i say it's designed by a god i can stop there and be satisfied with that if it's a naturally occurring oh no 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 never be satisfied remember i think i learned that from you, you never be satisfied because then you you will never you you will stop learning at that point right well i'm glad that you so got i, that. I i'm good. not saying that i i'm not i can't be wrong or something <clears throat> like that okay. i'm just saying that my confidence is really really high yeah yeah but there's there's at least two outcomes here i don't know how much more time we want to spend on this because i see uh, we have somebody named crystal maybe we want to get on but yeah um You've got, you look around, something could be naturally occurring and look designed, and something could be designed and look designed. And it seems to me that you acknowledge that something could be naturally occurring and look designed. But in that instance, you need a little bit more evidence to conclude that that's the case. More so evidence, you need more evidence to accept that, that it was naturally occurring, but looks designed, than you would to say, well, it looks designed, therefore I'm gonna conclude that it was designed and I'm done. That's what I. That's what I hear you saying. That you may mm -hmm. be using a different standard. I'm never done. I'm never done, Anthony. I'm never done. Good. All that's right. a great answer. A okay. Great well, it. if you want to continue not being done next week, we are here <laughs> to talk more. Um, but we do have to move on. We are running short on nice time. We need to, to thank our patron call uh, patrons and get to a couple more callers. But uh, thanks for calling in. Yeah, yeah. Adrian. it was a pleasure talking to you guys. Uh, uh, it was, it was an honor to talk to you guys. Uh, yes. I, awesome. Have a good rest of your day. I hope it gives that a little bit more thought because um, what I notice is that people tend to give a little bit more leeway to the claims that they, they like to be the case. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that's like, was his standard for accepting the claim that this design happened from a God a little bit more leeway maybe than if it was naturally causing. All right. Well, right. If, if, if his argument is, if it appears to be, then it is until proven otherwise. But uh, he, he also admits that things can appear designed that are not. Yeah. Then you've got that discrepancy there. Oh yeah. Um, By the way, um, I, I, sh I shifted subjects from like gender and, and stuff to like turkeys. And stuff. Oh. I, hope you don't, I hope you don't mind me doing that, but I was like, we don't need to go there. Anthony and the the crowd control is like, oh, nope, we're good. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's funny to me that he was trying to make a point about being right and he was wrong both times. <laughs> uh, but I was just amusing myself. Uh, you probably steered us in a direction that was more productive. Okay, um, hope so. Hope so. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to thank our top five patrons. Um, the Blazing Wizard Pope, Desert Heathen, Gary, Ward and Cully. And oh, Charlotte is also up at the top there. Thank you Thanks guys so much for donating. Thank you for uh, keeping the lights on here, both metaphorically and literally. Um, we love y'all and we're so excited that you're here with us today. Uh, we've got a few more callers. Um, I know that we've had some interest in someone named uh, Clear as Crystal um who is an ex-atheist and wants to talk to us about how we can know god so this is going to be fun this is what the whole show is about uh right. crystal yeah. can i call you crystal sure that's fine perfect all right hi welcome to the show hello crystal thank you thank you very much of course what you got uh, for us? yeah so tell us uh tell us how we can know god well, why are you no longer uh, an atheist wow okay well um um, well, you know someone when you meet someone, when they answer you. God, you know, I know, as an ex-atheist, no one could prove anything to me. So I find that interesting to try to prove something that is on is, is, that, is that what you think an atheist is, is somebody who's proved that there's no God, or do you have a different definition of it? No, an atheist, well, I, as far as I understand, as far as I was an atheist, I uh, figured if I didn't see God, then, or he doesn't answer me, or 
whatever, then I, w- then I would, wouldn't know or wouldn't believe that he was there. So that would be my understanding as an atheist. I'm not sure. I don't okay, know. Okay, so... Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, and uh, of course, being an atheist is an individual experience as much as being a theist is. So let me see. So for you, your reason for being an atheist is you couldn't see God and God wasn't answering you when you tried to talk to him. Uh, yeah. And plus, uh, what, what really made the uh, change was being told about evolution as science <laughs> and that um that kind of really was a a breaker for me because I thought. Oh, was, interesting. Wow. Okay, so you're saying change. It's, so you weren't always an atheist. You were a you were someone who believed in a god, and then you became an atheist, and now you're not anymore. Is that kind of the progression there? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. I, I. Okay. I. Yes. Yes. What was it about? What was it about evolution that was a factor there? How did that sway you one way or the other, if at all? Um, I just didn't couldn't accept or believe that if God, a God, that I would actually look up to, to, and that if God was God, existed, that that was the best he would be able to do, was to start something and then just let it roll oh. from there, uh, which I was see. what some theists believe evolution is, I think, but I mm-hmm. just couldn't accept that. So okay. at any rate, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious so, about what brought you back out. So we've got a pretty good idea. Um, and kudos, by the way, you're very good at summarizing these points very succinctly and moving us along. So thank you for that. So we've got an idea of what you eventually went into atheism with. Hey, I can't see God. God isn't talking to me, even though I'm trying to talk to him. And also evolution seems like a weird process for an all-powerful being to, to choose as creation. Um, so what brought you back out the other side then? Well, um, I was like 15 in sophomore in high school when evolution was taught as science mm-hmm. um, to me. Um, that changed it. It was very easy to become an atheist at that point. Um, it took about a good five years of looking around the world and my experience and realizing that man does not know how to deal with things. Man could not get things together, and uh, not by himself. And uh, it was basically I saw a Lord of the Flies existence on Earth, and we needed a (laughs) grown-up. That's basically how I saw it, and I'm being very honest here, and that just didn't make sense to me at this point, that man could do, really do very much right. I mean, obviously man can do a lot of good things, but not get it all together the way I would think, you know. So anyway. That's that, interesting. That so that's, do you mind if I jump in real quick? Because um, yeah. I've got I've got a question for, for you with that. Because uh, to an extent, I agree. Like humans just kind of do need a grown up sometimes. Um, but if you're looking around the world and you're seeing that humans just can't get it together, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're hurting each other, they're hurting the environment, or you know, whatever it is that you're seeing as a problem, and you say, hey, well, clearly we need someone better than us, or clearly we need an adult, or you know, some God figure. If God exists yeah. and we're still not getting it together, I don't I don't know. Like, like well, what what have yeah. you seen as an right. example of right. humans with a parental figure? Um, because if God exists and we're still not getting it together, then clearly he's not helping much, well, right? Where, where is God? Right, right. I get that. Um, what, I, what I understand, and I'm, actually, I, man has free will. We have our own, our own minds. We have our own hearts. And we have our own um, we have our own minds, our own will, and it, for God to have um, us seek Him, it would be out of our own will that you actually turn to Him. Now, um, if you don't want to know Him, you don't. You, you don't have to. It's up to you. But He will answer you. I'm not just saying you have to make it up either. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to. 
you don't have to, uh, you know, wish and wish to a certain extent, pray to a certain extent. You just have to turn to him, and he will hey, answer. He didn't answer me. Him. So okay. why do you think? Well, why do you, do you think this God answered you, and is that why you're no longer an atheist? Well, you, I know he answered me because. Um, I, I was in the. I guess do any of you know what depression can be, or how? Oh yes. How, okay. It, I, the morning I got up, I couldn't get up out of bed. I had to roll out of bed because I was so depressed. It was like clinical depression. Mm-hmm. Real. Sorry, de- that. And that was my. That, that would be my last day. I knew that I could do anything like this. This was not that, something had to happen. So I went to it, got myself through the day because I'm pretty strong-willed with doing things myself, like most people. You know, you get up, you go to work, you do whatever you have to do. Mm-hmm. And at the end of this day, I just knew, I said, well, now I just went through all my options. What do I do? And uh, something I didn't know if you understand the difference between a thought and someone else, but this was just a very small thought, mind, thinking, um, voice, I'm not even sure, but it just asked me, why don't you call out to God? And I actually answered it, because I knew it wasn't me, (laughs) because I said, well, because I don't believe in God, I mean, I, how would I call out to someone, and certainly someone I don't like at this point, if he did, if he did exist, and he started us with evolution, I don't like him. You know, I don't, I don't see the point of him to be there. Why would he do that? Why would God just start everything and leave us like that? So anyway, that was my dilemma at that point. And uh, very honest and very, all I'm saying is you can be totally honest with him just as you are. Just give him a chance. Just give him a chance to, and that's what I did at when I left out my, when I, uh, went through my other options, um, then I said, okay, well, God, help me. And that's all I said was three words. But now you have to understand that was at a point when I was, I guess I had nothing else to do here. I was at between a, a rock and a hard place, and God right. answered at that instant, taking everything well, out of me. Okay, yeah, so uh, Crystal, let's let's pause there for a minute uh, because that's a lot of information, and I know that yeah. we kind of want to have this as a conversation because um, I do have a couple that. questions. But yes, first, thank you for sharing that. Um, talking about mental illness is not easy, especially you know on a show that other people are watching. So thank you for sharing, um, and I'm sorry that that's an experience that you had and may continue to have. That's not fun, and it's not oh, something I would wish yeah. on anyone. <laughs> Um, okay. so I do want to, I do want to ask you a couple things. And the first one is just, I also grew up Christian. I also, uh, deconverted, um, uh, for other reasons. Um, but while I was deconverting, I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be converting. It was like waking up from a dream that was really nice and you wanted to go back to sleep, but you were being forced to wake up by your body or by the sunlight or whatever. And the entire time, I remember there were nights where I would be alone in a room crying about the fact that I was losing this relationship, that I was losing God. I honestly sought God. I was 100%. That was the ideal outcome of this whole situation would be I would prove to myself that God existed. God would talk to me. God would show me. God would come to me. And then I could put all of this questioning, all of this doubt behind me. It was a very painful process. And I know a lot of people for whom it was very painful. Now, my question for you is, why didn't God answer me? Okay. The best I I can give an example is um, uh, I, I don't know actually, but and that's that's a good uh, answer. I that is that I yeah do, that's fine. I but I do know that an example or a physical example perhaps is when a seed falls into a ground. If the round ground is fertile, ah, water, the four, the four the, patches of earth. Yes. Right. Um, if it's too 
it's a, I would only say that's the only thing I could explain. You know, if something is not ready, as much as you think you're ready, that's all I could think of. That's really all I can explain with that. Yeah. And that's understandable, especially if you were grew, if you grew up in a tradition where that was a parable that you learned as a kid and, and you now ascribe to that religion again. I'm assuming it's the same religion. You didn't you didn't hear God and are now a different religion than you were when you were a kid. I grew up, um, I was Catholic. I okay. was Catholic, uh, which is considered Christian, but yeah, I, I didn't believe everything in Catholicism, and I don't now. Okay. But. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering a couple of things, uh, if you don't mind me jumping in here a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm wondering... I'm wondering lots of things actually, because <laughs> you, know, you said some very interesting things. And these are things that a lot of people will say as the reason why they think a God is real. They were going through some difficulties. They think there's no way that they could have got through it by themselves. And it was only because of the grace of God that got them through it. And there are a lot of people who may think that they their ground is fertile and they're ready to receive it. And then there may be other people who lack that, look back on it and say, yeah, I just wasn't ready for that message or whatever. Um, I guess my my one of my questions to you is, well, there's an there's an even more fundamental question here. Do you do you think you have to think that God is real and got you through that difficult time to keep from falling into depression again? Do you um, do you need to have that? Okay, uh, no, because I he did answer me. He took it out of me in one minute, like a wink of an eye. I can only explain that. No, no, no. I, I, I wasn't. I wasn't getting. I wasn't getting to the actual no. event. I'm wondering. Right. If, do right. you need to? Do you need to have God in your life to keep from being depressed again? Um, I don't uh, keep from keep from going to that now. Uh, uh, that uh, extreme. Mm -hmm. Sure, because. Uh, without God, there is really no meaning in life uh, other than temporary meaning or what you try to make of it, uh, what okay. others say it is, etc. Let's shift, let's shift gears just a little bit now. Okay. How do you think, do you know people who had depression and were able to get through it without attributing it to a God or saying that they heard God's yeah. voice or anything along? You know people like that? I don't know. Um, I don't. Would you know say it's possible? Like I've heard. I've yes, I've heard. Uh, I do know there's medication people take. Um, mm -hmm. I know psychologically uh, things can be talked out of. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, because you go through certain um, you know things when you're a child that you need to talk to someone about. And you still okay. might need to talk to someone about. So good, good. That's so you, you've list, you've listed a couple scenarios where somebody could get through depression without attributing it to a God's voice or something along those lines. And why do you think? To a certain degree. We, to a certain let degree. me ask. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Let, I'm going to try re-asking this question. Yeah. If we if we talked about all your reasons for thinking God was real. And you started coming to the realization that you have no good reasons for thinking it. And you acknowledge that there are other people that can get through difficult times and depression without attributing it to a God. Do you think that that's something that you would be able to manage? Could you be an atheist and still manage your depression? Uh <laughs> If I can explain, when God answers you, there is no, there is no uh, wondering if if it's Him or not. You I'm know? not. Even, I'm not even uh, contesting whether you had the experience so, of this God or not. Right. I I understand. But what I mean to say is, once you do, when he, once He answers, you know Him. He continues after that. It's not just a matter of. Oh, that was one shot. You know, now I don't. Now I don't yeah. hear from him ever again because he continues always. Oh, you know, not always, but I mean, he continues to talk after or to show me things. Um, mm -hmm. On the way, on the way up to my steps after I was taking my dog out that that evening, ten o'clock that evening, I was walking up and and just instantly the thought was. Did that really? Did that really happen? And instantly, um, the Lord spoke to me within my heart. Now this time, and He just told me, uh, "You're all right now. You're going to be all right." 
and I knew it was God, and that was there was no question. And then I, I, under, I, I understand that you're having these. I understand that you had this event, and you're having subsequent events that seems to be confirming that the God is interacting with you and talking to right. you. Oh, right. My question. Right. And, and, my, I, I, can I let me just get this question out? Understand. Yeah, that's it's probably my bad. I'm. I'm even though I ask a lot of questions and I'm known for asking questions, I don't always ask very clear, concise ones. So I apologize. So I'll, I'll put that on me. My question is, if we looked at these experiences that you're reporting to us now, and you yourself came to realize that you have no good way of determining that it was your God, do you think that you would be able to still manage your depression and still have a loving, meaningful life without one? I don't know what it would be. I don't... I obviously can't answer. Uh, I'm not sure if I would be here because I that would he is the only reason that I'm actually alive right now. So okay, so uh, so th this is an important thing for people who are listening. Also, mm -hmm. these beliefs are critical to how we navigate the world and deal with hardships. And your God may very well be real. I don't think it's the case. I don't think you were actually communicating with a God. I think you got through this yourself, and you're stronger than you think that you are. However. You may not think that that's the case. And if this is a belief that you think that you need to deal with those hardships, then I think I would not be as um, persistent with my questionings until you came to acknowledge to yourself and to me or to other people that, uh, that you can find a way to manage like you've acknowledged that people can do without thinking that a God got them through that difficult moment. Because that's, that's where I am with you. Because... The last thing I want, and I'm sure V2, the last thing we want is to cause you harm. And I think, I, I don't really know what to think and where to go with this conversation because I don't know how devastating it would be to you personally if you realize that you have no good reason for thinking that this is true. And until I can get a sense of where you are on that, I don't really want to challenge you that much on your reasons for thinking that God is real until I can get a clear answer on that issue. Does that make sense? I understand what I understand what you're saying. I understand. I hope you understand that um, no one. I know no one can talk you into something um, spiritual. I, I do have a question uh, just to mm -hmm. show you about uh, thoughts, feelings, and memories. Thoughts, feelings, and memories. All of them are. You know they're there. You have your own thoughts, right? You have mm -hmm. your own feelings, and you have mm -hmm. your own memories. You know mm -hmm. they're there, but mm -hmm. no one can see them. Right. You couldn't prove them unless you spoke your thought and were honest about your thought, I guess you would say. But, you know, but nevertheless, they're there. It doesn't matter. That's what I'm trying to say is that maybe if you understood... When God, uh, uh, an invisible being, can be there, even if you don't see him or hear him at this point, but you, but um, that doesn't mean he's not there. Okay. Right. So no, I, I think I follow you. Right. right. I, I think but I follow you in that it's probably difficult to explain to us how important this event was to you and how real it was to the point where you say, I know that this happened. And I can imagine oh, it sure. must be really frustrating when you tell people this story and we don't find it all that compelling because we didn't experience it. So right. I, 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 I yeah. feel for you because I would be, I would be besides myself if this happened and I had no good way of communicating it to others that it did. It would be really frustrating. And I, I think I would put that frustration on the God. Why did the God do this to me to the point where I can't convince others that this is real? So I, I think I follow where you're at. However, I do still think that we could probably have a conversation about how you're validating that that was God to the point where you would start to wonder if it really was. And oh, I don't know. No. I, I, you don't wonder when you meet someone. When you meet someone, you meet, let's say you meet, uh, you meet the, the king of England or the queen of England. And then you turn around and say, well, gee, I don't know if I met her or not. I mean, you know you met the Queen of England, right, when you meet them. If you met them in person, you know the person next to you, you that they're there when you meet them. You don't turn around and go, oh, okay, well, I think they're there. No, you know they are there. So 
<laughs> you're not going to shake anything from me. <laughs> That's funny. You're not going to shake something from me by worrying about what I went through. It doesn't. That's would, that. That was the best thing I can go through in my whole life. That, that's the thing that concerns amazingly. me is that yeah. um, that's the thing that concerns me a little bit is that this was a profound experience that you've had. You're certain that it was this God. It got you through a very dark time. And I still don't know if challenging you on that position would make things worse for you. I'm, I'm no, actually you, still you, not sure. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't. Don't. You're not. You can't shake anything from, like I just said, you don't. I just met someone. You're not going to worry me to say, well, no, that person doesn't exist, mm -hmm. even though I just met him, right? <laughs> so, well, so I'm, kind of I'm glad that you feel confident in your mental health right now, it sounds like. Um, but I also don't think that if, if, if the idea of questioning that is laughable, I don't know if this conversation is useful moving forward. Of course, if you're willing to have a conversation about how you validate these things and are open to the possibility that you might learn something from us, then definitely call back. Um, but in the meantime, uh, stay healthy and as best as you can continue to look after your mental health. Thank you so much Thank for calling, Crystal. Much. Thank you very much. Thank All you, right. Crystal. Okay. So, Thank you for t kind of taking point on that, Anthony. I think that that is exactly the kind of conversation where street epistemology and that more open uh, kind of uh, introspective approach is so useful um, because that could have gone several different ways and because it's such a touchy topic and because we yeah. are concerned for, you know, her health and her <laughs> safety. Um, it is better to have conversations in as empathetic a way as possible. Right. Um, I do I just, want to, sorry. Oh, just, just on that last caller. Uh, thank you. Um, it could be really tempting for an atheist to want to, challenge a person on their views because we know all the arguments and if you're good at se i honestly think five questions and she would probably start to wonder if that really was her god the the thing though i don't know if i really want to go down that road with her because i'm not sure if she's and i asked that like three times and i don't yeah. think i really got a good answer it wasn't a sufficient answer to to me to say okay go for it mm -hmm. game on yeah. Uh, and uh, I, what I got back in return is, no, it was so real that there's nothing that you can do or say to make that happen. That's not what I'm asking. Right. I'm asking if it happened. And I know it sounds far-fetched. So um, we, yeah, we, we have to be careful with how we engage with people on these talks. And, uh, I, and she did reach out to us too. So it's kind of tempting to push it, but I don't know her. Um, yeah, We exactly. have to be gentle. And also, here's a here's a really good rule of thumb. I know that uh, at the beginning we asked her, you know, what an atheist meant, like what being an atheist meant to her. And she said, well, I couldn't see God and I couldn't hear him. So I was an atheist. And so, of yeah. course, if those that's your criteria for whether or not you believe in a God, if you hear something that you think is God, then that's going to slot right into the two things that you had as your reasons for being an atheist and um, maybe give you a turn. There are good reasons to be an atheist and there are less good reasons to be an atheist. Um, but to make the assumption that I am an atheist because I can't see or hear God or that Anthony is an atheist because he can't see or hear God um, doesn't get us very far conversation wise. It so, was a pretty wishy-washy definition of atheist and uh, yeah, Whenever someone says, I used to be an atheist, right? Like you hear that and you're like, oh boy, what does that exactly mean? And then it was like this thing with the how evolution just doesn't seem like it could be the case. And it was just really... It's just very, very interesting how many of these ex-atheists were Christians first um, and then go back to the God that they believed in prior. There's a reason mm. that you tend to go back to that. If, 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 if uh, Crystal had been a Catholic and then deconverted and then... Uh, asked for help and Anubis came to her and was like, I'm here, I'm ready to help you. Then we would take a different track to that conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Tell us more about that. But the fact that 
in a moment of stress, in a moment of deep depression, where you're 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 uh, you are more prone to things like auditory hallucination, um, you hear something or you feel something um, in an effort to preserve your own sense of self, your own sense of sanity. And it sounds very much like what you heard as a kid, those imprints, those things that you were indoctrinated to think uh, before you quote unquote deconverted. Yeah. Um, that that's not surprising to me. That's not compelling as evidence. Um, but now we yeah, don't, we don't know how long she was, she was raised with this belief. She didn't, I don't think she said, but she said but when it, she was it, 15, she deconverted and then it yeah. took her, I think she said seven years to get back to it. Yeah. Um, but I yeah, mean, if, you're, it's, if you're told your whole life that God will be there in your darkest moments when you need him the most, and then it just happens to be the case. And then you're using that as your justification for thinking that it's true. I mean, I can understand how you arrive there and how it could be, you could be so sure that that's the case. But like lots of people say similar things and they attribute it to completely different gods. Exactly. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Anthony. Um, oh yeah, for sure. I absolutely loved tag teaming these, these, uh, these calls with you and, and really kind of coming at this from a refreshing angle. Um, I think we always try, I know I do always try to kind of model the SE approach and, and ask yeah. questions, but you, you truly are one of the best people to do that with. Um, so I had a well, lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. This is really a treat to be on with you. Honestly, I love your work and I love what you are, you're doing at the ACA and it's, it's an honor to be on with you. And it's, it's an honor to see up and coming young people learning this approach and incorporating into your engagements and then teaching other people how to do this. This is exactly what we've been trying to do in SE for years is to try to encourage people to use this different tool and you're an excellent model for that. So thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. Oh, I'm feeling some love rings. So I'm going to go totally. out and. <laughs> They're not ready. Oh. They're not ready for us. They like Eric better than me, the love rings. They're not quite <laughs> sure if they can trust me yet. <laughs> there we are. Ugh. All right. So uh, you are going to be on with Jenna after this um, yeah. for AXP. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we want to thank, first of all, we've, we've kind of added this into our ending uh, essential workers, healthcare providers, first responders. You guys are amazing and we appreciate all you're doing and uh, you are in our thoughts and you are uh, ex beautiful, wonderful examples of secular humanism. Um, so thank you for all you do. For those of you who don't believe, um, we are your community, and I know that some of you might be stuck with people who think differently from you, or some of you might be missing uh, your groups of people who you usually hung out with to discuss things like this. I know I certainly am. I'm missing the ACA. Um, but we are here online. We're your community. We, we want to talk to you. We want to continue uh, to keep this conversation alive, and it's just as important even if we aren't able to be face-to-face. Um, but for those of you who do believe, we don't hate you. Hate you. We just think we you're just wrong. We just think you're wrong. <laughs> Crew cam! Crew cam! <laughs> awesome. That's fun. <laughs> that went by quick. Yes, it did. That was awesome. What are we doing, man? What are we doing? No, 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 you're done.